Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. With just a week to go, the midterm elections could hinge on inflation and the economy. We take a look at a new poll and what voters care about most. A political analyst expert says control of the U.S. Senate might depend on who will be elected in Pennsylvania. And for the first time ever, North Carolina has more unaffiliated voters than Republicans or Democrats. Recent polls in Nevada show U.S. Senate candidates are neck and neck. It's a race that could determine which party controls the upper house. Third party candidates could make a difference on election day. We have a summary of the races where they could either split the votes or trigger a runoff. The U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to prevent Congress from accessing former President Trump's tax returns, but it's only a temporary block until the court can look at the case more thoroughly. A House committee first requested six years of Trump's tax returns in 2019, but the Trump administration refused to comply. The chairman said the documents were the key to unwrapping Trump's so-called tax avoidance practices, and they could lead to an updated audit. But Trump said their real purpose was to release the returns to the public. Last week, a D.C. Circuit Court denied Trump's request to stop the release, prompting Trump to come to the Supreme Court. The court has just ordered the release be delayed until they can look into the case further. With just a week before the midterm elections, the economy is first on American voters' minds. NTD's Jessica Beatty has more on Gallup's new poll. The most basic of kitchen table issues, the cost of groceries and gas, will influence how almost all Americans vote in the midterms. That's according to a Gallup poll released Monday. It surveyed about 1,000 Americans across the U.S. between October 3rd and October 20th. It found that 98% of respondents said the economy will be extremely important, very important, or moderately important in determining who they vote for. Republican Senator Rick Scott told ABC's This Week Sunday that concerns about inflation will help his party regain control of the Senate. The election's going to be about inflation, and it's going to be about the border, and it's going to be about crime. Senator Scott said he expects his party to win in Georgia and Nevada, but Pennsylvania will be the hardest. Meanwhile, former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, who's now a host on MSNBC, said Monday that inflation is a global issue. She said there's not a lot Democrats could have done to change that reality. According to political polling site 538, Republicans and Democrats now have an equal chance of winning the Senate. But recent polls by Fox News and ABC Ipsos found that voters trust Republicans to do a better job handling the economy by at least 12 percentage points. But this may not be a big deal for Democrats. While Republican voters told Gallup their top three issues are the economy, immigration, and crime, Democrat voters said their top three concerns are abortion, climate change, and gun policy. Independent voters were in between, citing the economy, abortion, and crime as their top three. The partisan priorities confirm that turnout is key for both parties. Whoever can get more of their voters to the polls will have a better chance in the midterms because they're unlikely to sway the other side. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. All eyes on Pennsylvania. An expert says control of the U.S. Senate could come down to who will be elected in the state. And for the first time ever, North Carolina has more unaffiliated voters than Republicans or Democrats. Only a week to go before votes are counted in this year's midterm elections. Many are watching Pennsylvania and the high-stakes race that could hold the key to control of the U.S. Senate. Polls show Democrat Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman in a neck-and-neck battle with Republican Dr. Mehmet Oz. An expert says it's the one place where analysts suspect that Democrats have a chance to turn a Republican-held Senate seat. So, you know, control of the Senate could come down to Pennsylvania and whether or not Republicans can get a hold or Democrats can flip. And so that's really what it, what's at stake here, you know, the final piece in who controls the United States Senate. Oz, who's from neighboring New Jersey, received an initial endorsement from former President Trump but has struggled to convince conservatives and Pennsylvanians that he's one of them. His opponent, John Fetterman, is facing questions about whether he's healthy enough to do the job after a shaky and uncomfortable debate performance last week. Fetterman had a life-threatening stroke in May. I thought it was kind of a, a bad situation for Mr. Fetterman. I didn't think he should be put in that situation. 
he probably should have dropped IRAs when he had the stroke. I think it's a concern, of course, um, but I think a lot of times in these situations, it's the lesser of two evils. I'm not saying that, you know, they're evil, but, um, you know, I have to go with what I think is going to be best, and I still think that's Fetterman. And in North Carolina, for the first time in the state's history, the number of registered unaffiliated voters outnumber both Democrats and Republicans. Yeah, I mean, usually by this point in the election cycle, you can kind of get a feel for how one party is going to do relative to the other party. This has been a very chaotic election season. In North Carolina, unaffiliated voters make up almost 40 percent of the electorate. This makes the races for the U.S. Senate and a key congressional district even tighter in the closely divided state. Republican Senator Richard Burr is retiring. Now three-term Republican U.S. Representative Ted Budd is going against Democrats and former state Supreme Court Chief Justice Sherry Beasley for the Senate seat. In the redrawn 13th House District, GOP newcomer Bo Hines is competing with Democrat State Senator Wiley Nickel for the seat. Neither candidate currently lives in the district. The race for Nevada's Senate seat could be a tight one. Recent polls show the candidates are neck and neck. The outcome could determine which party controls the chamber. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg tells us more. A New York Times Siena College poll released yesterday has Nevada's two candidates for U.S. Senate tied. Both incumbent Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto and Republican challenger Adam Laxalt were sitting at 47 percent. A poll conducted by CBS News and YouGov last week also had them tied. And another poll has Cortez Masto with a slight lead of two points. That survey group was slightly Democrat-leaning, with a majority answering they voted for Biden in 2020. Other recent polls have Laxalt with a slight lead. Nevada's Senate race could help determine which party controls the chamber. In an interview with Fox News, Laxalt said if Republicans take a majority, they will launch investigations. I hope we can get yeah. these gavels so we can start investigating, you know, big tech, for example, what they're doing at the close of these races by shadow banning us, by, by hiding our emails. 90% of our emails go to junk and only 10% of hers. That is straight up election interference. I hope we go on offense yeah. in the Senate if we take the majority and start holding them accountable. Cortez Masto says Laxalt helped fuel the January 6th Capitol breach by peddling conspiracy theories about the 2020 election and that there should be consequences for people who undermine democracy. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The founders of the election integrity group True the Vote are in jail after being found in contempt of court. The two leaders refused to identify a key figure in their election fraud allegations. Here's the backstory. They accuse Eugene Yu, the CEO of election management software company Connect, of storing poll worker data on servers in China. Yu was arrested in October after an investigation by the Los Angeles County District Attorney and charged with storing poll worker data on servers in China. But meanwhile, Connect filed a lawsuit against True the Vote for gaining author, unauthorized access to its computers and obtaining information from them. The court asked both True the Vote defendants to identify who gave them access to the data. But they said, but the two said they couldn't reveal the person as it would impede an ongoing FBI investigation concerning the matter. And when it comes to the outcomes of the midterm elections, third-party candidates could make a difference. This is especially true in states that have runoff elections. Here's more on that story. In the state of Georgia, Chase Oliver is running for the U.S. Senate as a libertarian candidate. He believes his candidacy might produce an effect nationally because he may well throw Georgia's Senate race into a runoff. It's conceivable that neither Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock nor Republican candidate Herschel Walker will get 50 percent of the popular vote. And in the race for governor, libertarian candidate Shane Hazel could also make a difference. Republican Governor Brian Kemp also may not reach 50 percent in his rematch against Democratic challenger Stacey Abrams. In Georgia, when neither of the candidates get over 50 percent of the popular vote, a runoff election is automatically triggered. Over in Utah, the race for the U.S. Senate is between Republican incumbent Mike Lee and independent candidate Evan McCullen. The Democrats didn't feel the candidate in the heavily red state, and McCullen is making a strong run against Lee, trailing by only five points. In Oregon, Betsy Johnson is running as an independent in the race for governor. Also running for governor are Democratic nominee Tina Kotek and Republican Christine Drazen. Something Johnson may drain enough Democratic votes from Kotek to make Drazen the first Republican governor in the state in more than 30 years. An Emerson College poll in October found Drazen leading Kotek 36 to 34, with Johnson polling 19 percent. 
Over to New Hampshire, a super PAC has canceled more than $5 million in advertising for Republican Senate candidate Don Bolduc. The PAC is linked to Republican Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. The Senate Leadership Fund says it's, quote, shifting resources to where they can be most effective to achieve our ultimate goal, winning a majority. Bolduc is still trailing incumbent Democrat Senator Maggie Hassan in polls, but a survey since released by Emerson College shows Hassan's 11 percent lead over Bolduc has narrowed to 3 percent. The move follows public statements made by Bolduc that he would not support re-electing McConnell as the party's leader. So far, Bolduc has not said publicly who he'd like to see in McConnell's place. Bolduc has stated publicly that he can defeat Hassan with or without the support of the National Party. And still to come, more districts are deciding to ban students from using their cell phones during school hours. This appears to be a trend nationwide. Get the details in just a minute here on NTD News. Authorities have arrested drugstore worker Richard Allen in the slayings of two teenage girls, 14-year-old Liberty German and 13-year-old Abigail Williams. They were killed in the woods outside their small town in northern Indiana five years ago. Our lives for five and a half years have been in a search, search mode. We're not doing that anymore, so we're all just kind of feeling our way and figuring out what our purpose is now. What do we do next? The girls vanished after saying they were going for a hike on February in 2017. Authorities long suspected the killer had some connection to Delphi, a city of just 3,000 people. They called Allen's arrest a step in the right direction and encouraged the community to come forward with more information. Allen has pleaded not guilty. Libby's grandmother, Becky Patty, told reporters that Allen once processed photos for the family at the CVS store in Delphi where she worked. She says she didn't charge them for the photos. He said the families, they always knew that the suspect could have been living right amongst us, hiding in plain sight. A New York correction officer was stabbed in the head roughly 15 times by an inmate yesterday. He's now unconscious and undergoing tests. It's unclear what led to the attack at Rikers Island. Authorities say the officer was working in the protective custody unit. In a statement, they called it an unprovoked, heinous and callous attack while the officer was just doing his job. Neither the officer or the alleged assailant are being identified at this time. And federal agents in Massachusetts say they've solved an important piece of a murder investigation that is decades old. Authorities announced Monday they have identified the body of a woman killed in 1974. They say a combination of DNA evidence and research into the victim's ancestry helped them identify the woman as 37-year-old Ruth Marie Terry. Her body was found on a sand dune in Provincetown, Massachusetts, nearly 50 years ago. Investigators say she died from a blow to the head, but her identity remained a mystery for all these years. Had she lived, Terry would be 86 years old now. Authorities still don't know who killed her, but they say they are committed to finding out what happened. A trail of candy wrappers helped some Georgia sheriff's deputies solve a string of burglaries. Coweta County investigators tracked the discarded Milky Way wrappers to the home of one of the alleged offenders. As a result, seven people were arrested in a string of burglaries of homes in vehicles in the Noonan area. They had taken a gun, food, and a bag of miniature Milky Ways. Most of the crimes took place within walking distance of the suspects' homes. The investigation is ongoing, and deputies believe more arrests will follow. A man who calls himself the Wolf of Airbnb is accused of scamming renters out of more than a million dollars. Federal authorities say Conrad Beecher failed to pay rent for at least 18 apartments in Manhattan in 2019. Beecher allegedly listed the units as short-term rentals in Airbnb and other rental platforms. Authorities say Beecher made more than $1.1 million over three years. Prosecutors also say he used fake tax return documents to make more than half a million dollars in Paycheck Protection Program loans in 2021. Those loans were designed to provide relief to small businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Beecher now faces two counts of wire fraud and one count of aggravated identity theft. No word on how he's pleading, but the two counts of wire fraud each carry a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. And more school districts in the nation are banning students from using cell phones in public schools. Behind the trend are concerns about distractions in class and other behavior issues. Here are the details. 
Schools across the country continue to struggle with students' smartphone use. Concerns about distractions in class, fights in hallways, and other behavior issues have prompted some schools to ban the device. Earlier in October, the Philadelphia Board of Education voted for a contract of up to $5 million with Yonder. It's a San Francisco-based company that makes locking phone pouches. The school district serves more than 200,000 students. Philadelphia district officials wrote, with a cell phone free environment, schools can increase engagement in the classroom. Furthermore, the absence of cell phones during the day can help lead to less incidents of cyberbullying, reducing the number of students leaving the building and returning illegally by texting their friends, and a reduction in class cuts. Meanwhile, Hopewell City Public Schools in Virginia started using locking phone pouches this fall after years of trying to curtail phone use. The school district serves about 4,000 students. District officials wrote a letter to parents saying, while we have attempted to accommodate student phones over the years and limit their use, we are finding that they are causing much more harm than help during the school day. Most U.S. school districts have policies to limit phone use during the school day. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, as of 2020, nearly 77% of schools don't allow students to use smartphones for non-academic purposes during school hours. Millions of students' personal information has been exposed because of a tech firm's lax security. The Federal Trade Commission has ordered the education technology provider Chegg to strengthen safeguards around its customers' data. Chegg's businesses include renting textbooks to students and scholarship search services. The FTC alleges the company failed to fix problems to secure the data it collects even after it was hit with four breaches since 2017. The breaches threatened the sensitive information of approximately 40 million customers. That includes social security numbers, email addresses, and passwords. The FTC wants the company to take more protective actions, such as bolstering security and limiting the data it collects and stores. Delta Airlines pilots could be going on strike soon. In a union vote, 99% of Delta pilots authorized a strike to get a new contract. The pilots say they're working with an outdated contract from 2016. The union says negotiations have been on and off for more than three years. If there is a strike, it won't happen until after the Thanksgiving travel surge. Delta says negotiations are progressing. Airline officials say they are confident the company can reach an agreement with the pilots. The Powerball jackpot has climbed to $1.2 billion. It comes after no one matched the winning numbers on Monday night's drawing. The next Powerball drawing is Wednesday night. If someone is lucky enough to get the winning numbers, it will be the second biggest jackpot in Powerball history and the fourth biggest in U.S. lottery history. And still to come, in a rare protest in China, a man hung banners on a bridge in Beijing questioning Xi Jinping's policies. He was quickly arrested, but overseas Chinese have stepped out to defend him. And South Korean police admit failures in the Halloween stampede that killed more than 150 people. Authorities are moving to quell public anger over the disaster. We'll have the details soon when we return. As Americans, it seems like other people have been telling us what to do, how to live, and how to think. But that's not how we founded the greatest nation on Earth. During times of powerlessness, we found power. And we found power through taking action. Through action, we find solutions. And through solutions, we find freedom. The supply shortage has made it harder than ever to keep your shooting skills sharp at the range. Introducing Strikeman, a laser firearm training system that allows you to practice your shooting skills at home without wasting a dime on ammo. Using our laser cartridge, target, phone mount, and award-winning phone app, become a proficient shooter in under two weeks. Create training templates with firearm drills and get live feedback with progress tracking on your shot accuracy and shot times. Beat personal records and compete with friends and family to crown the best shooter in the group. Put the power back in your hands with Strikeman. Public outrage in South Korea has grown alongside the climbing death toll from Saturday's Halloween crowd crush. Authorities are promising a swift and thorough investigation into the police response. Here's more. As South Korean President Yoon suk yeol attended memorials on Tuesday for the 150-plus people who died in the weekend Halloween party crush, authorities moved to calm public outrage over the disaster. 
the country's police chief admitted crowd control was inadequate on Saturday night. That's when the deadly crush took place after tens of thousands of mostly young revelers packed into the narrow alleys in the popular nightlife district of Itaewon for the first mask-free Halloween festivities in three years. Korean National Police Commissioner General Yoon Hee Kun promised a thorough probe into the police response. Police dispatched just 137 officers to the area, despite estimating as many as 100,000 people would gather that night. We will conduct intensive investigations quickly and seriously without exception. We will make it especially clear whether police responded correctly to the emergency calls. This comes after South Korea's top security officer, Interior Minister Lee Sang-min, angered the public by saying that deploying more police would not have prevented the disaster. On Tuesday, Yoon told citizens he felt a heavy sense of responsibility in the tragedy. At the Yongsan Multiplex Sports Center, briefly used as a morgue in the early hours after the crush, a lost and found space was set up on Tuesday. Some 800 items of clothing and belongings left by victims and survivors are laid out for visitors to sift through. As those who lost loved ones await answers from authorities, these material items carrying the memory of the tragedy sit there waiting to be reclaimed. As the country enters a week-long period of mourning to honor those who died, new details are emerging about one of the victims in the deadly stampede. One of the two Americans killed is an Ohio congressman's niece. Republican Representative Brad Wenstrup released a statement Monday saying his niece, Anne-Marie Gieske, died. Wenstrup says his entire family is mourning the loss. At least 26 foreign nationals are among the dead. A one-man protest in Beijing has sparked protests outside China. Known as the Bridge Man, the protester hung banners over a bridge in Beijing in mid-October, criticizing Xi Jinping and the Chinese regime's lockdown policies. He was soon arrested. Over the weekend, overseas Chinese showed their support for Bridge Man at a protest in London. Entity's Jane Wuerl spoke with some of the protesters who did not want to reveal their identities. In Beijing in mid-October, a rare protest. Days before the CCP's National Congress, smoke billowed from an overpass as a man dressed as a construction worker unfurled banners on a heavily guarded bridge. Footage shows the writing on the banners say no to COVID-19 tests, yes to food, no to lockdowns, yes to freedom, no to lies, yes to dignity, no to cultural revolution, yes to reform, no to the great leader, yes to voting, don't be a slave, be a citizen. The man, Peng Lifar, was soon arrested. It sparked protests outside of China, including here in London's Trafalgar Square. The protesters didn't want their identities known out of concern for their family and friends in China, but they wanted to show their support. What's the feeling among Chinese people here at this protest? Uh, Quite encouraged by the bridge man, because at least there is one man in China who could openly risk his life and has maybe actually already given his life to protest. And we feel that if we don't do anything here because we are relatively safe, then we feel guilty about this. But also we feel that we are risking our lives and our families. It's like choked, getting choked. Even though we are far away, we are abroad, but we are still getting choked. She said they don't have a formal protest organizer and the organization is decentralized to keep everyone safe. People don't know where he is right now. So we're doing this to support him and to protest Xi's dictatorship. Another protester who didn't want to be identified said he admires the bravery of the bridge man. He's definitely a hero. We definitely really admire his courage because it's not an easy job, not at all. I felt very emotional when I saw that slogan. That's exactly from that bridge man. He's not just physically strong, he's also mentally strong. He writes down everything we want to say. There's only one place in China that's not censored by the CCTV camera. You know where? Toilets. So they put this slogan in the toilets and translate into English. The bridge man's message is openly displayed here, but his whereabouts in China are unknown. The long arm of the Chinese Communist Party reaching citizens, Chinese citizens living abroad. Here's an update on overseas Chinese police offices. We recently reported on one of them, located in the center of New York City. 
So far, U.S. authorities have not publicly responded. Over in Canada, federal police are investigating reports about Chinese police stations illegally set up in Toronto. Across the Atlantic, a Chinese police office in Ireland has already closed its doors by order of the Irish government. Germany and the Netherlands are also investigating Chinese police outposts in their countries. Now, one more European country is on alert, Hungary. The nation is one of the most important for the development of China's Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative in the region. A Hungarian lawmaker visited two alleged police stations in the country's capital. In response to information requests from him, Hungary's Ministry of the Interior said it was unaware of the presence of Chinese police operating in Budapest. Chinese authorities did not inform local authorities before setting up the police outposts. Congressman Don Byers aide has been fired from her 34-year job on Capitol Hill. The aide, the aide, Barbara Hamlet, allegedly tried to facilitate meetings with U.S. officials on behalf of the Chinese embassy in Washington. According to National Review, a congressional office reported Hamlet to the House Sergeant-at-Arms after she allegedly requested one such meeting with a Republican staffer. GOP leadership has responded they condemned the growing influence of the Chinese Communist Party in American politics. Byers' office said that it had no knowledge of Hamlet's alleged activities in this regard. However, the incident is affecting him ahead of the midterms. His Republican challenger for Virginia's 8th District is Karina Lipsman. She now describes Byer as being compromised by the Chinese Communist Party. Secretary of State Antony Blinken held an hour-long conference call with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Central to their discussion was the ongoing war in Ukraine, trade, and international security. Uh, Secretary Blinken and uh, Foreign Minister and State Counselor Wang Yi had an opportunity to uh, discuss a number of issues, but Secretary Blinken, for his part, thought it was uh, important uh, to raise, uh, once again, Russia's continued war against Ukraine uh, and the threat it poses to global peace and economic uh, stability and prosperity. This is something that the PRC has heard uh, from us directly a number of times. The State Department said Blinken also discussed the need to maintain open lines of communication and manage the U.S.-China relationship responsibly. U.S. leaders have accused the Chinese Communist regime of tacitly supporting Russia's war of conquest. According to reports, the Communist Party leadership learned of the invasion of Ukraine at least one month ahead of time. They even asked Russian leader Vladimir Putin to postpone the war until after the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. Beijing has also been criticizing the multilateral sanctions against Russia as a violation of Russian sovereignty. But the latest call may set the stage for a meeting between Biden and Xi at the G20 summit next month. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And just ahead, the UK's COVID-19 public inquiry has asked to see Boris Johnson's WhatsApp messages when he was prime minister alongside communications with other senior officials. And two French researchers speak about the adverse effects of vaccines. That's in response to the European approval of COVID vaccines for children under the age of five. We'll have the details in just a minute. British lawmakers are demanding an investigation into allegations that Liz Truss's personal mobile phone was hacked by Russian agents while she was foreign secretary. The prime minister's office did not comment on the reported hack. However, a spokesperson insisted that a robust approach is taken to protect ministers' data. British newspaper The Daily Mail on Sunday reported that agents gained access to sensitive exchanges with foreign officials on Ukraine, as well as private conversations with Kwasi Kwarteng. The Daily Mail, the Daily Mail reported the security breach was kept secret by then Prime Minister Boris Johnson. It comes as the British government is facing accusations of ill discipline and not taking national security seriously enough. The Labor Party has criticized Home Secretary Suella Braverman for returning to the role after being forced out for sharing a sensitive document via a personal email. The Home Secretary is in charge of national security in the United Kingdom. In the UK, an independent COVID-19 inquiry has been set up to examine the response to and the impact of the pandemic. It will also examine the effectiveness of lockdowns in controlling the spread of the virus. 
Stage two of the inquiry began Monday and is looking into political and administrative decision making. During the first preliminary hearing of the public inquiry into COVID-19 on Monday, Counsel Hugo Keith KC said the inquiry has asked to see Boris Johnson's WhatsApp messages when he was Prime Minister, alongside communications with other senior officials. The inquiry secretary, Mr Ben Connor, had written to the Director General, Propriety and Ethics of the Cabinet Office to request the retention of records across government. The Director General had replied setting out the steps that had been taken to ensure records relevant to the inquiry were being retained. Module 2 of the inquiry will scrutinise political decisions and actions in relation to the pandemic. Inquiry Chairwoman Baroness Heather Hallett will examine the effectiveness of mandatory lockdowns in controlling the spread of the virus, including the relationship between the timelines and the length of the lockdown and the trajectory of the disease. The single most important question. Is it possible to say what the likely effects of earlier or different decisions to intervene would have been? The counterfactual proposition. Bluntly, would lives have been saved if the lockdowns had been imposed earlier or differently? Questions will also be asked about the role of the SAGE expert panel, including whether any lessons may be learned from how scientific advice was provided to policymakers in other countries. Did the committees have relevant and accurate data? How effectively was data distributed through the government? How reliable was the infectious disease data modelling? Did the data modelling cover the right eventualities? Was there an over-reliance on epidemiological modelling or mathematical modelling? A further preliminary hearing for the module will take place in early 2023. Public hearings will start in the summer, scheduled for around eight weeks. The European Medicines Agency has approved COVID vaccinations for children under the age of five. But the move raises questions, including about possible adverse reactions. NTD's France correspondent David Vives spoke with two researchers. U.S. President Joe Biden said last week that every American aged five and over should get at least one dose of a COVID vaccine once a year. European countries appear to follow the same path. The European Medicines Agency, or EMA, earlier this month approved the use of the mRNA vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna for children between the ages of six months and five or six years. The EU agency said the benefits of the shots outweigh the risks of possible side effects. Emmanuel Dahl is an author and health data analyst who has participated in EU research programs. In a book titled Keep Your Hands Off Our Children, she analyzed the impact of the 48 protocols the French government has imposed on children and teenagers since the beginning of the pandemic, including mass vaccination campaigns. In any case, COVID has sadly killed the elderly, but it has not affected the young, neither has it affected the teachers. But the psychiatric and pediatric hospitals are full, so the reality is here. So, we are facing a real public health crisis. We are going to see the consequences of all this. The consequences are on our children. In August, Dahls participated in an awareness campaign on COVID vaccine side effects in the southern city of Toulouse. Across the city, people saw such posters, stating that one child out of a hundred has experienced severe adverse reactions from the vaccines. Vincent Pavon is a statistician and researcher who was involved in the campaign. He explained how he arrived at that number. If we really want to have a reasonable estimate of the total number of side effects from adverse reactions reported through the passive pharmacovigilance, we have to multiply the figures by a factor of 10 to 20. The purpose of this poster campaign in Toulouse was to show the figures as if they were corrected as they should be. That is to say, how they appear in the official health agency reports would be validated by everything that university pharmacovigilance has known for a long time. From this underreporting, we arrive at the quite realistic figures of a so-called serious adverse reaction per 100 injections. In France, the monitoring of adverse reactions, also called pharmacovigilance, is based on reports sent by doctors with patients who experience side effects. 
Pavon says another method to monitor side effects would involve observing a large group of individuals and recording how many of them declare adverse reactions. But health authorities haven't made use of this approach. Dars and Pavon say the burden of proof lies with the vaccine manufacturer, not the patients. It's not the doctor's role to decide whether a particular symptom is an adverse reaction. He is not fulfilling his role as a physician. His role as a physician is to declare, not to investigate. There are other very competent people to do that. In fact, the burden of proof has to be reversed. That is to say that normally it's up to the manufacturer to prove that his product is safe, especially for a prophylactic treatment, which is the vaccine. And here we ask the patients, so there is a big problem from the statistical point of view. The European Medicines Agency has warned the pandemic was still ongoing and urged EU countries to launch booster campaigns before the winter. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Next, we zoom in on one doctor's story in the battle between free thoughts surrounding COVID vaccines and efforts to prevent misinformation regarding treatment. Joining us now is Dr. Peter McCullough, author of The Courage to Face COVID-19, Preventing Hospitalization and Death While Battling the Biopharmaceutical Complex. We spoke recently about plans for vaccine requirements for school children, and it's great to have you back on, Dr. McCullough, even if it is over some troubling news. Thank you for having me. Can you explain more about the threat of your being stripped of your certifications in internal medicine and cardiovascular diseases? The American Board of Internal Medicine uh, which certifies doctors in their specialties and administers the uh, board certification exam and re-exams, uh, has sent me a threatening letter, uh, 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 basically uh, threatening uh, decertifying my internal medicine and cardiology board certifications of which I've passed multiple exams. My clinical record is perfect. There's no flaw in my clinical care. Uh, they have stated uh, that I have violated a new policy that they've written regarding COVID misinformation. That is just so troubling. So if you have a perfect record, is it just that they don't agree with your stance on these certain issues? They appear to be hitting me regarding my U.S. Senate and state Senate testimonies. And, you know, when a doctor testifies in the Senate in the setting of a medical emergency, a worldwide pandemic, uh, you know, I am on the floor under oath answering questions to the best of my ability. And what they are doing represents a legal infringement upon my right as a citizen to give my best estimates of what's going on based on my interpretation of the literature and my publications on COVID-19. So I think this is a serious warning to all Americans in all walks of life that our basic tenets of uh, constitutional rights to free speech and giving uh, responsible professional opinions are now in jeopardy. You mentioned your contribution to these state bodies or you know governmental bodies. Are there other doctors that have faced similar retaliation for doing this? There are. There's been a series of doctors, virtually everyone who's testified in the U.S. Senate or multiple state senates by request regarding their opinions on the pandemic are now being hit by a whole variety of professional organizations, including those who uh, certify board certification. This is important because if I lose board certification, I can no longer contract with insurance companies, have hospital privileges, and this has nothing to do with my clinical care. The board should only be concerned about clinical care. And it's, it's um, I think, disturbing that the American Board of Internal Medicine has, has basically carved out COVID as a special condition. They don't put any other restrictions on what I can say or I can't say regarding heart attacks or kidney failure, diabetes or other problems, but why COVID? That is interesting that they are singling this out. And you were recently fired as editor-in-chief of cardiorenal medicine and reviews in cardiovascular medicine. You've held that position for years. Can you explain any reasoning behind this? I'm a longstanding editor of both journals and I was removed as the editor with no phone call no um, <clears throat> no explanation, no editorial board meeting, simply removed as an editor. And this all occurred around the time uh, that I testified in the U.S. Senate uh, on two occasions and then in the Texas Senate and other state senates uh, on multiple occasions. So this is a pattern of censorship and reprisal occurring uh, against me and then, again, other doctors in my circles 
for giving our, giving our honest appraisal of the pandemic. Author and Dr. Peter McCullough, so glad to have you on to share this with us today. Thank you. Drug maker Pfizer posted its earnings for the third quarter today, beating Wall Street expectations. The company reported a revenue of $22.6 billion. This is more than 7% higher than market expectations. Earnings per share came in at $1.78. This is 27% stronger than expected. The drug maker's shares rose 2.4% in morning trading. The strong performance is mainly due to better than expected sales of the vaccine. Third quarter sales of the COVID-19 vaccine came in at $4.4 billion, blowing past estimates of $2.6 billion. The company CFO said Pfizer's COVID-19 franchises will remain multi-billion dollar revenue generators for the foreseeable future. And coming up, Israel holds its fifth parliamentary election in less than four years. Former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is making a bid to return to power. And overloaded landfills are plaguing Armenia's capital. How will it cope with the dire straits of waste disposal? Get the full story just after this break. We're entering an unprecedented period of economic turmoil. The economy is unstable. Our government is in shambles and the global war on energy has created a domestic crisis. Americans need a way to protect their financial future. One way to ensure your wealth in retirement is by purchasing physical gold and silver. We can help. You can roll any part of your retirement account into a gold or silver IRA. Better yet, you can open a gold or silver IRA in five minutes or less using our online application. Preserving your family's financial legacy is a choice that's always available to you. And when you're ready, we're here to help. Call us and speak to one of our IRA professionals. Let's build your financial legacy together. GSI Exchange, wealth for generations to come. Welcome back. In Israel, voters are heading to the polls for the fifth time in less than four years. They will choose a new parliament and a new prime minister. Former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is making a bid to return to power. His party is in a tight race against the governing alliance led by outgoing Prime Minister Yair Lapid. Lapid decided to seek an early election following defections from his ruling coalition, which is mostly only in agreement on opposing Netanyahu. Final opinion polls published last week showed Netanyahu still short of a majority in parliament. This could open up the prospect of weeks of coalition wrangling and possibly more elections. Security and surging prices have topped the list of voter concerns. Despite the frequent elections, voter turnout is high at nearly 50 percent by 4 p.m. local time. This is the highest since 1999. And over in Brazil, trucker protests over their election are escalating, with roads already blocked in 16 states. The action aims to show support for outgoing President Jair Bolsonaro. Drone footage captured road conditions in a central Brazilian state. Trucks, cars, and even tractors occupy lanes in both directions as people wave Brazilian flags. According to the highway police, the trucker's blockade has increased from 12 to 16 states out of 26 total states. It could lead to economic chaos in Brazil and even hurt its agricultural exports as the world's top food producer. Bolsonaro lost the recent election to his left-leaning competitor, Lula da Silva. He has yet to break silence, but a communications minister says he plans to address the nation later today and will not contest the result. In Lima, Peru, a group of police officers disguised as superheroes captured members of a family allegedly engaged in drug dealing. Agents disguised themselves as Spider-Man, Captain America, Thor, and Catwoman. They entered the house of a family of alleged drug dealers and thieves after breaking down the door of their home with a hammer. Local authorities reported the costumes were used so officers could go unnoticed by neighborhood residents. Police pretended to be entertainers attending a a show at a nearby school. 
The colonel in charge of the operation said the family was engaged in a drug dealing and mobile phone robbery. Four people were detained during the operation known as Marvel. Peru is the second largest producer of coca leaf and cocaine after neighboring Colombia. Argentine federal police have reported that Italian mafia leader Carmine Alfonso Mariaco has been, reca- has been captured. Interpol put an international warrant out for Mariano's arrest in 2015 on charges of drug trafficking and illegal arms sales between Europe and Latin America. The 68-year-old boss of the so-called Negreta Mafia was detained on October 26th by the Argentine federal police. A police report says the criminal activities were carried out by the Italian Mafia, which had been based in Argentina for a couple of years and by their Albanian counterparts in Europe. The detainee has been put under the jurisdiction of Argentine authorities. A garbage separation plan aims to help one Armenian city with its waste disposal woes. Their overloaded landfills are causing discomfort for locals. Here's a closer look at how the plan works. Overfilling landfills have turned into a major headache for residents in Yerevan, the capital and largest city of Armenia. Each year, an estimated 320,000 tons of waste end up in piles at dumps like these. In any case, we feel bad because the smell is disgusting. Every day in the evening, a terrible smell spreads. I have been living here since the 1980s. It has always been like this. We can't sit quietly outside in the street for an hour. Mosquitoes bite. There are stray dogs in the landfill that bother us. Now, a trash management plan may present a way out through separate waste collection and smart disposal. In 2020, NGO Landscaping and Environmental Protection launched the pilot project. They placed different colored containers across the city and introduced locals to new rules and waste separation. Blue for plastic, yellow for paper, and black for glass. Last year, in 2021 as a whole, a total of 660,000 kilograms of plastic, cardboard, and glass waste combined did not go to landfill. This, I think, is a very large number that we were able to save. That's equivalent to over 700 tons. Despite the program, most of the city's garbage still goes unsorted into regular containers. For the moment, there are only 135 separate collection sites in Yerevan. But with financial assistance from international organizations, organizers plan to double that number as soon as possible. There are also European projects that are very interested in making sure waste management is at the highest level here. And with these projects, we plan to increase the number of points to 300 in Yerevan. Plans are also in place to bring residents' platforms to handle metal and hazardous waste including batteries, lighters, and thermometers. The sorted waste is sent for recycling through various waste treatment plants. One of those companies is Yerevan, based in Cleveland. It recycles mainly cardboard and plastic. The main production of our enterprise, which has been operating for 11 years, is the processing of polyethylene terephthalate bottles, as they say, plastic bottles. 1,500 to 2,000 tons are processed per year. This is a huge number, although in terms of capacity, we can double the production. Recycled plastics eventually go toward making synthetic fertilizer, chemical fibers, and more, while processed cardboard is used to make packing boxes. After the introduction of the separate waste collection program, the Cleveland company has seen a 15 to 20 percent increase in productivity this year. Coming up, a chocolatier at Paris's annual chocolate fair puts a spicy twist in his treats. He's incorporating the Carolina Reaper, the world's hottest chili. Details to come on NTD News Today. It's difficult to come up with something new at Paris's annual chocolate fair, but one French chocolatier has found a way to put a twist on his chocolates. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. These are Damien Vidal's Bielantet chocolates. The name is a play on a French idiom for head first. Besides traditional ingredients such as raspberry, cassis blackcurrant liqueur, and passion fruit, these chocolates are flavored with Carolina Reaper the world's hottest chili pepper, according to Guinness World Records. 
A chocolate made with Carolina Reaper, the most powerful chili pepper in the world. It's not a common chili pepper, but we're here to wake up people's taste buds. Vidal managed to put just enough chili in them to give them a kick, but not too much. Two Japanese tourists and other visitors at the chocolate fair tried the shiny chocolate chili balls. French visitor Justine Bonneau agreed. It's really good. It's very good surprise. The heat comes afterwards. At first it's fine, and then it grows and it gets hot. Vidal is an award-winning pastry chef. He's worked in top Parisian restaurants and was invited as young talent at the Paris Chocolate Fair. He said this delayed effect was exactly what he was looking for. Sweet and subtle at first, then a fiery explosion, which fades after a few minutes. I was looking for a peculiar taste, and I thought, why not use the most powerful chili pepper in the world? So with my partner, we decided to go for it, and we've had to go through several recipes, several attempts, and tests to find the right balance, one that pleases the most people. French households on average eat 28 pounds of chocolate per year. France exports around 250,000 tons of chocolate each year. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A new world record in the transport industry. A Swiss railway operator has completed a remarkable journey with the world's longest passenger train. Made up of 100 cars, this train is 1.2 miles long. It completed a journey of more than 15 miles over the Swiss Alps along a UNESCO World Heritage Route. Clanking over viaducts and spiral tunnels, the train took its passengers through the changing landscape of cities and valleys. The train is so long that at some points the beginning of the train was leaving a tunnel while the end was still entering. The train was operated by seven drivers and can reach speeds of up to 21 miles per hour. Its operator is Ration Railway of Switzerland. Their record-breaking effort was validated by Guinness World Records and marked the 175th anniversary of Swiss Railways. The Timber Sport World Championships wrapped up for the year in Gothenburg, Sweden. Bringing home the individual title this year was Brad DeRosa from Australia. DeRosa scored 60 points in the six disciplines. Those include the underhand cut, stock saw, standing block chop, single buckle, springboard, and hot saw. He was followed in the rankings by competitors from the U.S. and Canada. DeRosa DeLosa also led Australia to a gold medal victory over the United States in the team event. New Zealand finished in third place. The championship began in 1985. It features a series of woodcutting competitions for athletes to showcase the use of axes and saws in the typical manner of lumberjacks. A hair-raising climbing competition up the side of towering Versaca Dam in Switzerland. Organizers say it was the world's first multi-stage climbing competition on artificial routes. Eight teams of two elite climbers each competed, but only four pairs made it to the finals. The teams fought side by side to climb the vertical face of the dam on a route almost 600 feet long. The route involved 280 moves and some 400 holds. In the end, Team Spain narrowly defeated Team Slovenia, taking the crown in 51 minutes and 27 seconds. One of the Slovenian climbers is recovering from an unfortunate fall in the final stage. Of the two winning Spanish climbers, one was a combined climbing gold medalist at the 2020 Olympics. The other was a runner-up at the 2021 IFSC Climbing World Championship. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.